I say something? Because uh, when we were there this past week, uh, we attended a church, uh, Calvary Baptist Church in up in uh, Brownsville, New Brownsville. So, so we were there, we attended, and we were in the service. And then the one thing that I've noticed between our church and their church is like we welcome our visitors here all the time. New faces, we welcome them. But over there, uh, we just left, and I thought, Maybe I should steal their hymnals. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't, the, the, the thing is, they don't sing from the hymnals anymore. <laughs> they, no, there's no hymnals on, in, the, in the chair. So. Somebody, else, somebody else already stole them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just a joke. <laughs> Let's sing another hymn. That's why I like this church. We sing from the old passion hymns. We still have our hymn books. Hymn 513, Oh How He Loves You and Me. 513, 513. guys so much. I appreciate you. You know, Mario was talking about us being a friendly church, and we sure always want to continue to redouble our efforts to work hard at that. You know, we, we tell people during meet and greet, don't just walk up to your very best friend and hang out with them. Make sure you try to get by and shake hands with somebody you don't know. I can't help but I'm looking at the Cedillos back there, smiling and laughing and not listening to me. No, just totally kissing. And that was your brother that just walked away. But look at Jesse. He, he forgot to shave today, by the way. I just want everybody to notice. I can remember when these two visited Maranatha Baptist Church. This was a long time ago, guys. It really was, wasn't it? Your kids were so little back then. And... Uh, a couple of our folks, uh, this was their first time with us, uh, took them around the corner and took them into uh, the youth room, and they thought, I can't believe it. We've already done something wrong. <laughs> They're taking us in another room. Can you believe that? And uh, they heard the gospel, bowed their head, trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, and uh, boy, what a blessing. We've seen now uh, your kids in Bible college, your kids growing up, and you guys uh, uh, faithfully uh, here at Maranatha. I got to tell you something. It's uh, it's really precious when when you do recognize it. It's never to be taken lightly. It's always a big deal, and it really is when somebody takes the time to visit your church. Amen. And you and I'm talking to uh, family tonight, uh, Wednesday night crowd. Listen, you're so integral. It's so important that you uh, recognize. Susie's got her hand up. I can't. 11 years. And uh, how come Jesse looks so much older? I don't get it. How come? You know, the only one that aged in this whole deal is Jesse, not the rest of us. Amen? Yeah, well, anyway. But hey, look, you know what? Always remember how, how it was for you when you visited for the first time. And it's always good to help people, get them to wherever they need to be and, and, and be a help. Uh, we're thankful for our deacons and others, but we're we're, we're counting on you because you're, uh, you're the, the representation of this local church. And so we thank you guys so much. I, I enjoy mentioning this because you do this so well. Amen? Let's get into the Word of God tonight. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Philippians. We continue uh, 
in Philippians. We have a few weeks ago, actually we can say months ago, because I kind of like to park myself sometimes on a particular verse and stay there for a while, uh, have been focusing on expository messages on Wednesday night where we're basically preaching through a book in the Bible, uh, verse by verse. That's a that's a real help. It's a great tool for pastors, and it's a great help for pastors because we know where we've been, we know where we are, and it gives us a better idea about where we're going. We're not taking uh, Scripture out of context, and we're just, uh, I think it's a careful tool to help us. And it's a good way to study the Word of God, amen? No doubt about it. And uh, that's my excuse for why we're hanging out in the first chapter of Philippians for maybe a little bit longer than someone might think. Notice with me tonight, Philippians chapter 1. Yeah, that's right. We're still there. Philippians chapter 1. It's been a few weeks. Notice verse 27. And these verses may not be as familiar to you as a lot of Scripture is. Notice verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. I love that right there, don't you? That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Matter of fact, Paul Chapel liked that so much, he, he took that name, striving together for their publishing ministry. Verse 28, And in nothing, terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which ye saw in me, and now here to be in me. As we have opportunity to spend some time with these scriptures, let's ask the Lord to help us. Father, even now, might we appreciate that even as we work our way through this marvelous letter, that... Holy Spirit of God, as you speak to this preacher and you convey to him what you would like to convey to us, uh, might we get a hold of tonight how absolutely contemporary this block of Scripture is in that our behavior, that's right, our Christian behavior really does matter. Help us to see that, appreciate that, and appropriate that. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. And it really is true, isn't it? You know, in this world in which we live today, we kind of compartmentalize, you know what I mean? Well, I'm this way when I'm thinking about politics, and I'm this way when I'm driving a car, and I'm this way when I'm at church, and we got to be careful about that. You just never know who might be watching you. It's kind of like... It's kind of like that time when you decide, well, you know what, I think I'm just going to sleep in. I'm not going to make it to church. You want to know who notices first? Your neighbor. They'll come walking over and going, hey, Fred, I noticed that uh, you were, your car was still parked in the, in the driveway on Sunday. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's really the way it is, for sure. Some of us have had that happen. You know, it's kind of like that, that one fella who said, you know, I, I'm having a tough time making it to church, and, and, uh, and, and I just don't even know if I want to go anymore. The, you see, they don't even really like me over at that church. And this fellow's mother responded and said, well, there's a few good reasons why you should go. Number one, you're 47 years old. Number two, you're the pastor of the church. You ought to go. You ought to be there, Amen. I said 47 because that was a long time ago for me, so that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be me. Notice again, Philippians chapter 1, Philippians 1, 27. Only let your conversation be as it 
becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, having striving together for the faith of the gospel. May I just tell you, uh, we strive together. We stand fast in one spirit on truth, on teaching. Uh, some people have got it really backwards. They think, well, let's just water down the teaching. Let's dial back on doctrine, and then we'll all just get along. Well, the opposite really is true. That's what will create chaos. That's what will create real problems in the church. In some circles, you can go to a church, and the associate pastor or the youth pastor is bringing something entirely different than the pastor. One might believe in eternal security, and the other one might believe uh, that, that tongues are for today. Whatever the case may be, nobody's even on the same page. When you're solidly focusing on the teaching of the Word of God, of, 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 the, of the Bible, of all the Bible, you appreciate that we're able then to stand fast in one spirit. Amen. On September morning, a father and his son were on their way to Grand Central Station in New York City. The son was, was taking the train to a college in New England. For a moment, the father just stood there. And I can appreciate this. I remember how this was for me. He just stood there wanting to say many things, but he could only say one. And he said this. He said, he said, son, never forget who you are. As he sent his child off to school, he said, never forget who you are. You see, worth more than a book of rules or, or core uh, a core of lectures on behavior uh, was one challenge uh, that this father makes to this boy to remember, never, never forget how you've been raised. Never forget who you are. And you know, that's what our hope is for our family. There's no doubt about that. But how much more should we appreciate that that's who we are as Christians? Let's never forget who we are. Let's never forget what we believe. Let's never forget what it was like when we were lost, how when we came to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, as newborn babes, we, we began to grow and, and uh, we're able to now appreciate the important stance that we take is always based on the Word of God. Let's not do what many do. Let's not forget who we are. But not only is this the case when it comes to uh, how we conduct ourselves when we're around each other, when we're walking in and out of church with a smile on our face and everything looks great and wonderful, but also when we walk out there into the world. Amen? When you go to the workplace, when you, you are, are uh, an employer with employees, when you're uh, going back to school, when you're doing anything and everything that you do as a born-again Christian and really as a local body of believers, we don't want to forget. We don't want to forget who we are. As a matter of fact, the word conversation is a great word. It refers to the whole manner of life. It's not just talk. Uh, uh, this is a plea for Christian behavior, uh, and it's based, uh, it's based on our identity with Jesus Christ. We are citizens of the kingdom of God, and our conversation. I like the word, uh, even in the way we would use it. Our conversation should never be casual and crass when it comes to the things of God. I, I, I don't get this. I don't get how, and it just seems like you see this happening more and more, where when the music become, becomes more casual and more, I'm just going to use that word, crass, it seems like right along with it, so goes the preaching. And that's just wrong. Now, I'm not talking about being mean-spirited and, and ugly about this. But I think we ought to take very seriously what we believe. Amen? 
I, I believe that we ought to have a smile on our face and a skip in our step, but hey, look, just let's know this. Uh, we, we call ourselves fundamentalists for a reason. You know, some people get really scared. They don't even want to say that. Don't use that word. They might think you're the Taliban or something, you know? You're, he's a, did you hear what he said? He's, he's a fundamentalist. That, that means we believe in the fundamentals of the faith. That's what it means. It means that, guess what? This is the Word of God. It's, it, this, this is not a book that contains some of the Word of God, or a, a help book, a self-help book. No, this is God's word that we hold in our hot little hands. And, and we believe that, that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin and that he is God in human flesh. We believe the fundamentals of the faith. And so that ought to be our conversation. And that ought to be our conversation when it comes to having a right heart and a right spirit. You know, how can we, how can we recognize that we've been miraculously changed when we said yes to Jesus Christ when we, are, when we got saved and then think that no brother or sister can grow in their walk and relationship in the Lord and, and, and talk in a crash, casual way about, you know, another brother or sister. You know, may, you know that... that water cooler conversation that goes on. Well, it's just me and you, so I just want to tell you. And you know, it's interesting how sometimes when people want to talk about people uh, in Christian circles, we'll, we'll, we'll still call them brother or sister. <laughs> well, I don't know about brother such and such, but I saw him driving on the wrong side of town last week. You know, really? You got nothing else to talk about? This conversation, these kinds of, of just casual ways we just can go about our, uh, our lives thinking it doesn't matter that much, do matter. They really do. Christian behavior should be consistent. Amen? Now, we all know that we have good days and bad days, and we may even be going through some difficulties ourselves, but there needs to be some consistency. The primary characteristic of Christian behavior is that it is consistent with the gospel of Christ. Don't tell me what you believe. Show me. Amen? One's behavior in life should conform rather than contradict the gospel. You can't be saying one thing and doing another. The word, as I mentioned a moment ago, translated conversation could also actually really mean, you can take it deeper than that, citizen life. This is who you are before everybody. Uh, it, would have, it would have had special meaning for the Philippians since Philippi was a colony of Rome and was therefore governed exactly as though they were a part of Rome. They were a satellite citizenry of Rome. The, the people used the Latin language, they wore Roman dress, and insisted on being stubbornly Roman. <laughs> it almost sounds like Texans, doesn't it? You see, to these people who were uh, conscious and, and proud of their identity as Romans, Paul appealed to their, their higher identity. You're more than a Roman, you're a Christian. You are a Christian. As Christians, uh, we belong to a colony of heaven, and, and that, is, uh, th that is where we will eventually be, praise the Lord. But this colony of, of members of heaven who are on this planet, who are on earth now, need to appreciate where their citizenship lies. Uh, our lives should be consistent with the principles on which um, this group, I'm talking about born-again Christians, were founded. We're founded on the gospel of Christ. And so Christian behavior should be consistent. You know, we live in a very inconsistent world. Uh, when you step outside of the teachings of Jesus Christ, when you step outside of 
uh, the Bible, when you step outside of Christian um, belief, you go into a world that says you can't, nothing can be 100% absolutely true. Everything is negotiable. And you, you know, we can just go on and on about that. You want to know what people are seeking when they walk in? They're seeking truth. They don't know that for sure, and they don't even know what truth is, but we better stick to it, and we better make sure that that's what we're bringing, amen? And they need to see consistency. How many of our kids are growing up today without any consistency? They hear one thing one week and something else the next week. What was trendy two years ago or 10 years ago is no longer cool today, and and it's sure going to be different tomorrow. We know of families... I mean, the real truth is, when we minister to families today, there's a very high probability that if the person's over 30 years of age, they've probably had more than two or three relationships. Uh, Kids might be coming from uh, other families, or this family may not have even gotten married. I'm telling you, there's a whole different kind of world out there than, than what we maybe even remember a few years back. Before we got saved, let me just tell you something. The world needs to see the consistency of the gospel. Secondly, Christian behavior should be constant. Christian behavior should be constant. Christian behavior must be constant. Paul's admonition uh, is to stand fast. You know, can I just tell you that language meant a lot to those at Philippi. They knew what it was like to suffer persecution. They knew what it was like to, uh, to, uh, to recognize how much it costs just to say they were Christians. And how about you and I today in the 21st century? Are we ready and, and willing to really stand fast? I mean... How are we to be constant in Christian behavior? What does it mean? Well, we know what it should mean. It should mean that the gospel never changes. The truth of the gospel never changes. Now, technology might allow for different ways for us to uh, get the gospel out to a lost and dying world, but we never change the message. It stays constant. But you see, this constancy that we're talking about also has to do with us as Christians. Constancy demands unity, people of one spirit. Often this is spoken of in Scripture, and it matters. Uh, One mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. That's what the Scripture says. uh, Our word... uh, is, is derived from part of that word translating, we get the word athlete from the word striving here. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be running the race. We're supposed to be appreciating. The best athletes uh, are those who come together in unity. It takes all players playing together to win. You can have a, you can have a team full of superstars, but if they're not playing together, they're not going to win. I mean, we're to strive. I, I love this language, don't you? We're to strive together in teamwork for a, for a common goal. Our desire is to know Christ and to make Christ known. And every missionary that we take on, every ministry that uh, we're involved in at Maranatha Baptist Church, that's the focus. We are striving together. I think this also speaks to our relationship with sister churches. It's not my job to uh, run down the street and try to run somebody else's church. I love them and I'll pray for them. And I'm talking about, I'm talking about good, solid, Bible-believing churches. And, uh, and my focus will be here where we're at. But we want to be a help and a blessing. We, we come together uh, and we're involved in... Uh, doing things together in ministry when it's, uh, when it's something that we can do. But I can tell you this. This is 
only going to be done when we're allowing the Holy Spirit to work, when we're focusing on what we're supposed to be doing. Christian behavior. Finally tonight, Christian behavior should be courageous. Christian behavior should be courageous. In verse 28, Paul added courage as a necessary ingredient of Christian behavior. In nothing, in nothing, be terrified by your adversaries. How about that? Can I just say sometimes I am a little terrified by my adversaries and I need to be reminded that greater is he that is in me than is in the world, amen? In nothing be terrified by your adversaries. Christians are to show courage in the face of persecution and suffering. And you know what? We don't know. Before the Lord comes, we might see a whole lot more suffering than what we see. We might be shocked to think this, but things might not be as easy for our own children as they are for us today. You see, the fact that, that they had adversaries back then indicated that some kind of persecution was at hand. And that for the first century church, that's what grew the church. It was the persecution that grew the church. They were basically scattered abroad. And what did they do? They witnessed. They planted churches and won people to Christ. You see, when Christians show, I'm talking about God-breathed biblical courage, when Christians recognize that their adversary, no matter how great he may be, and you should take him very seriously, anybody who takes lightly the enemy, that's as much a mistake as being overwhelmed by the adversary. When Christians recognize that, that this adversary has no chance against our great God, we're able to have the courage that we're talking about. We're able to not doubt and, and be um, taken aback. You see, Paul, Paul, don't you just love to study Paul? I mean, here was somebody who could refer to himself as the least of the apostles, and he said some pretty big things. And if you don't study the Word of God, you might think he was kind of a big-headed, braggadocious guy, but really, in reality, he was one who demonstrated more humility than most people do. He always just had a one-track mind. He just said, you know what? I want to preach Christ, and I want to point people to Christ. And as we read earlier uh, through this study, he meant it when he said to live as Christ, to die as gain. Let's just, uh, let's be hard-headed for the truth of the gospel. Amen? And uh, you know what? I like to keep it simple. I like to just realize that that's my role, that's my job, and that's for all of us to be our desire. Amen? Hope this has been a little bit of a help to you tonight, and uh, go back through it. I, I, I especially like verse 28. It's one of these kind of verses that we probably don't park on too often, but uh, I hope it's been an encouragement to you. I, you know, on a Wednesday night, you have folks who, who are here because... They are growing in their walk and relationship with the Lord. They're serving. God's using you. Thank the Lord for you. And you know what? Uh, what we see here in this wonderful letter uh, are charges and challenges for us to continue to move forward. Amen? Amen. Let's do this, guys. Let's have some time of... Uh